Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I have a fantastic panel of speakers to speak with me um, to the subject of transformational economics. Now, um, if anyone in the audience kind of feels as though economics is not in need of transformation, um, then it's possible they've been living on a different planet for the last uh, two or three decades, and certainly for the last uh, decade or so since the financial crisis. Um, what the financial crisis taught us, I think, very clearly was the sense in which um, the uh, economics that we've inherited, and uh, it has to be said that it's a largely Anglo-Saxon, quite male-dominated economics, um, may or may not have been successful in building a great deal of um, what we now know as consumer capitalism. But it has failed quite considerably in terms of um, ensuring equality for everyone, ensuring the development of the poorest in the world, protecting the ecosystems on which we all depend for um, our livelihoods and indeed our lives, and even failed in terms of um, the its own aims in terms of creating financial stability in the economy uh, for people and for planets. So this, we, we live in, another, in other words, in, in a sort of sense of a kind of economics that has failed. And that's exactly why uh, transformation is what is necessary at this point in time. And we've learned cruelly and harshly through the last uh, year uh, that that weakness in economics has in fact led to healthcare systems which were underfinanced, healthcare workers who were not paid as they should have been paid, fragility in the lifestyles and the livelihoods of the most essential people in the economy, those who actually keep our lives and our livelihoods going in the food production system, in the healthcare system, in the education system, they have been the casualty of an economics that has failed. And for their sake, if not for the planet and for future generations, this idea of transforming economics is absolutely critical to the place that we find ourselves in now. Now, we're talking, of course, in particular about the race to zero, and zero means um, net zero carbon, and that means trying to live in a world which doesn't trash the climate. But we're also talking in the context of um, the protection of biodiversity, the protection of other species, the species that live on the planets with us, the, the species uh, whose habitats we're rapidly destroying, and indeed the oceans that are uh, horrendously full of the detritus of human activity and which are, again, a kind of catastrophe that has emerged as a result of an economics that is no longer fit for purpose. And that's why this panel is important. It's a huge pleasure to be here um, with such wonderful people. So I'm, I'm going to introduce them very briefly as I, as I introduce them to the conversation. So let, let me introduce first um, Sharon Burrow, who is the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. She's been a voice for the environment, a voice for sustainability within the trade unions for a number of years now. She was previously president of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, and she's a passionate advocate and campaigner for social justice, women's rights, environment, labour law reforms. Sharon, perhaps I could turn to you to start with, and if I were to ask you to transform economics, what would be first on your list? What's ripe for transformation in the economics that we've inherited? I. Could you unmute yourself, Sharon? So, Tim, you basically said it all. The consequences of the current economic model has failed people and it's failed the planet. And, of course, it's not the planet that is the most important thing here as much as we want to live on a healthy planet. It's simply that the, crisis, the, the climate emergency is a crisis for the future of the human race itself. So we're living on borrowed time because... Our economic model actually created huge inequality, just as it indeed raped the resources of the planet without looking to renew the uh, capacity for us to live in, in security with nature. So we have to deal with, even before COVID-19, that incredible historic level of inequality. 
You know, it's it's income inequality. It was driving people to anger and despair because they can't live on the wages. And when you look at the model of our economy, with hyper-globalisation in the 80s, since then we're about three to four times richer if you use GDP as, a, as simply an indicator, and yet the labour income share has been like a roller coaster from that time. And our, our labour market's broken. Not only do we have exclusion of women and, uh, and those of, it, of different ethnicity, uh, but in fact, we have 1.6 billion of our workers, 1.6 of 2 billion, who are in the informal economy now with COVID-19 facing destitution every day because they, they have no minimum income, no social protection, no minimum wage, no rule of law. They live in this desperation. And of the 40% in the formal economy, then only um, uh, more than a third of them live in an insecure world, short-term contracts, not enough money to live on, and many of those are those frontline workers that you actually described. A lot of this uh, of the transmission issues have actually been higher risk because people are working two and three jobs out of desperation. You then marry that with the climate emergency, and we can't ignore the, the fact that we have to deal with both of these things together and the health crisis and the economic devastation that the impact of this crisis has driven. So we say we need a new social contract. It's got to be about recovery and resilience, and it has to have for us a number of things, but at its heart, jobs, jobs and jobs. We've lost 500 million jobs. I talked about the 1.6 billion. You know, we need jobs, jobs and jobs, but they have to be climate-friendly jobs. They can't be jobs that don't contribute to the climate journey we have to take and now we've got, you know, not even 10 years to stabilise the planet. And then we have to look at what we need to do then about rebuilding the model of our supply chains, of the fair competition floor for global trade, of, of human and labour rights and environmental standards, of mandated due diligence. And, and I will simply say that at least in the foundations, the European Union has got this right, a social pillar of rights, a green deal, and indeed uh, just transition. Now, if you can put all of that in the mix to drive jobs so people have security and underpin it with social protection for resilience, we've got a chance. But we won't have a chance to rebuild trust, let alone repair the, the, the fractures that are now craters post-COVID in our social and, uh, and indeed employment models. We need a just future, but we have to work together to build it, and it will take all of us to make this possible. Thanks, Sean. I mean, I know that you have been a, a fantastic advocate for the idea of um, a just transition, but would you agree that there, there was a time when it, it was sort of seen that the, the environmental agenda, the sustainability agenda, was kind of seen in conflict with people's jobs? And do you think that we have now definitively got beyond that? slightly misplaced conflict. It's why we argue just transition, Tim, because if it's not just, if people don't see a future for themselves, then the pain and the fear of, uh, you know, destitution will drive opposition, even if we know from our polling two-thirds or more of working people want urgent action on climate right now. But they also need urgent action when the same number of people can't live on the wages, that their, their income has stagnated or gone backwards with that massive inequality gap. So we have to shift a model that says shareholder primacy, nothing else matters but profit, basically. And if you look at the fact that we can finance this recovery, both jobs and indeed resilience through mitigation and adaptation on a climate basis, that will help if we involve people, but we have to build trust and actually ensure that they see a plan for the future. But we can finance it with tax. If you just think about the big tech, tech companies, then their profits were increased by 41% just to June through the pandemic. By the time we get to December, that's going to be more. We've still got unfinished business, not just on the digital tax, but on base erosion and profit shifting, or in other words, a minimum 
income thre a tax threshold for corporations. We've got more billionaires on the planet we've ever had. That's People can't spend that kind of money. So a wealth tax or a billionaire's tax. And of course, uh, you know, coming back to unfinished business in other areas, border adjustment, carbon taxes, whatever it is. We need to, to, to build a recovery with tax, not uh, austerity, to build trust. And in that context, if we're going to rebuild trust in our democracies, we have to get way beyond GDP and have a government transparency and accountability that engages people and their expectations beyond the polling uh, box. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I, wa I want to pick up on the, the point about finance, and I think it's something that we could spend a little bit of time on in the conversation um, over the next half an hour or so. But um, a, a good place to start, actually, would be one of my other panellists, Naoko Ishii. Um, Naoko is the director of the Centre for Global Commons at the University of Tokyo. But in your past, Naoko, you were also in the Ministry of Finance in Japan, and you were um, CEO and chairperson on the Global Environment Facility. So so you know a little bit about finance and you know a little bit about finance for the environment in particular. Um, what, what kind of transformation do you see as essential for a, a new economics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, as Sharon did so well about explaining this and uh, one aspect of the crisis we are facing, it's more like an uh, inequality, surging inequality. And actually, that we are all facing with this multiple crisis and, um, as of today. And uh, uh, the, the, the Sharon did really did so well about the human aspect of this and uh, the crisis. I want to put a little bit of the, uh, to, to see the same picture from the environmental or natural capital as side of the side of the story. But that said, I, I really do not want to have a dichotomy between social or human versus nature because now by now it's so integrated, just uh, referring to your last question. So what we have been seeing for the last uh, decade or, or so is this a clear collision between human, uh, let's say, economic system, our current econ economic model, and the natural system. There is a clear collision between those two, and that's why we have this and uh, uh, um, uh, the climate change and uh, the tragedy and uh, the climate change crisis, biodiversity crisis, and then our land and the ocean, the forests are all in danger. And the and the only way to really address it is that then how we can put our economy in harmony with this uh, natural um, capital or uh, let's say the capacity of the natural system and uh, the people call it the planetary boundaries apparently we have already transgressed some of the very important earth system it's a, a uh, the capacity of the planetary system. And it's so urgent for us to find a way to transform our economic system so that we can continue to prosper within that planetary boundaries. So in, in your question, that in response to your question, we need to find a way to how to accelerate the energy transition. We need to find a way to how to live in cities in a much more harmony with nature. We need to find that and that is a food system, which not many people know, but then it's a huge threat to the natural environment, to the much more um, kind of regenerative, and sustainable, resilient, gen regenerative food system. Then we need to find a way that current economic model to much more circular. And uh, how we can really do it uh, in, in, in such a short time, or let's say we have only 10 years to transform our economic system. One, um, and going back to your question about finance, one way to address that is how we could really identify and measure and value of the natural capital and to uh, kind of cons consistently report it so that we can, con we can uh, incorporate this value of the natural capital in the current economic system. So that is actually the one way to um, transform through also the financial system that transform the current economic system. But also doing so, uh, just also referring to what the Nashalom put so beautifully, we need to also find a way to put the value of um, the human capital or societal capital so that our current model can incorporate those and uh, the cap, uh, capitals which are not really um, are not yet valued and uh, rightly, and that's why we have this this crisis. But then the one thing which this COVID nineteen did it in a sense 
well to us is that uh, because of this, we come to know this uh, health crisis also has the same root of the climate and um, environmental crisis. It's basically we are putting um, a lot of pressure on that, um, that uh, natural system. So the solution to the both environmental crisis and the health crisis really go to the same place. It's basically how to really transform our current economic system within these planetary boundaries. So let me stop here. Thanks, Naka. I want to push you. I want to push you a little bit further because I mean you've worked in a, a Ministry of Finance. You worked in the Global Environmental Environment Facility, which is a financial mechanism to try to improve the planet. Um, do you think there's a, a kind of danger in sort of looking to the finance system to save the planet when it can't really even save itself? Um, <laughs> You know, if, if, if we're honest about it, the financial system got itself into the biggest financial mess in a century just 10 years ago. It's barely got itself out of that. And we're now faced with a crisis, a health crisis of enormous mm -hmm. proportions. Where, where do you see, the, the, again, the transformation, particularly within the finance sector, that could right. lead to a, um, something that, that is healthy as a financial system, let mm -hmm. alone healthy for the planet? Mm. No, actually... Um... I really don't like the word green finance because green finance almost means that there is a brown finance. <laughs> I think that the finance system needs to be transformed so that the all uh, the uh, instrument and uh, the, uh, equipped with the financial system needs to really help that transition. And that going back to my first point on how to identify and value and measure of those and the capitals which are yet to be identified one and the value in the uh, evidence-based. So it's a natural capital is one thing, human societal capital is another. So from that point of view, I was a little optimistic and I kind of become a little excited about that for the last what, maybe two, three years, uh, this e ESG investment becoming uh, attracting a lot of attention from investors and consumers, but then it really needs to uh, be uh, much more rigorous, that they rigorously are uh, done in terms of identifying the right ones and putting that then, um, and, and to, to measure the value and uh, based on the, the science. So that then it's a good start for the last few years, but it really needs to, um, to, uh, to, to build and uh, to be built further based on the science. But uh, on that one, if we continue to push it and, uh, and uh, in response to the more like an appetite for the consumers and the investors, I think we, we will have a good way forward. Okay. We just need to do it rapidly. <laughs> we do certainly need to do it rapidly. Thanks, Naoko. So I'm going to come on to Jayati Ghosh. Um, Jayati, it's, a, it's an enormous privilege to have you on the panel. I mean, you, you have a, um, a lot of experience. Jayati is professor at the Centre for Economic Studies and Planning, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and she's taught economics there for 35 years. Um, it's, it's an economics of a particular kind, isn't it, Jayati? It's an economics whose institutions we still, to some extent, suffer from. And, and when you look at the, the challenges in the finance sector, it's in part a result of the institutions, the structures, the incentives, and the way in which that has been governed for longer than 35 years, let us say. And you've had a long time to critique that and to think about it. Where does transformation lie out of the place that we're in? You know, you've just put your finger on it, Tim. You can't transform economies without transforming economics because too much policy is determined by what is, frankly, you know, I think uh, Sharon called it no longer fit for purpose. It's not just out of date. It was never really in date, I would argue, because it was based on too many wrong premises. But I think the first and fundamental thing we would have to do is to shift what economics calls externalities and non-market activities into becoming internal and central to the study of economics. I, I think Naoka mentioned this when she talked about uh, you know, nature, and Sharon also mentioned it when she talked about the significance of care work. But these are absolutely central. We have to recognize the importance for all of our material existence of nature in its different forms. We have to recognize the significance of care and create caring economies, recognizing that it's already subsidizing and underpinning a whole lot of economic activity, and unpaid work. Again, there's a strong gender dimension to this, which I'm sure everyone knows, so we, I won't go into that. 
Now, once we do that, uh, again, I think Sharon has mentioned this, the notion of GDP is utterly flawed, of course. And the trouble is that because uh, you know we keep coming up with a sort of spectrum of other measures and we keep talking about a dashboard or about many different indicators, I don't think that works because unfortunately, policymakers keep ending up back with GDP. So that even today, when you're looking at the pandemic, everyone is talking about a recovery based on when the GDP has recovered, which uh, is completely the opposite of what we need. It's also flawed because it gives raw, rise to completely flawed notions of productivity. Productivity, what does it even mean in sectors like finance and real estate, where it's based on asset bubbles and you know, it has nothing to do with what we would imagine should be productivity. So we really have to discard that notion, but to discard it adequately, we have to present a simple alternative that policymakers can grab and, and run with. Um, People say that you know the others are too complicated. Everyone who has studied GDP knows that it's incredibly complicated and based on all kinds of assumptions. We have to actually present an easy, quick alternative that can be uh, dealt with. Finally, I would just say that you know we it's very clear. I think you had mentioned the, the talk of you know sort of New Deal and and so on. And we rem remember that and the New Deal was based uh, on three R's, if you like, recovery. Here, I would say we shouldn't call it just output recovery. Sharon mentioned employment. It has to be the recovery of good quality employment. It has to also involve the other R of redistribution, which was a central element in the, in the New Deal, and it has to involve regulation of all kinds of markets and non-market activities um, in, in ways which are socially inclusive, desirable, just. I would argue that it's not just green. Of course, it has to be green. We, we know in, the, in this group, I think we don't need any further elaboration. It, but I would say it has to be multicolored. I mean, certainly climate change, uh, certainly you know the use of the way we deal with all of the issues around the environment, but particularly also blue. Water is such a big issue in the developing world. And it is an ex it's a time bomb waiting to be exploding. I mean, I, I have a feeling many of the wars of the 21st century may well be about water. It would have to be purple, recognizing the care economy and the entire range of unpaid care activities and underpaid care activities. It has to be red for redistribution. But of course, it has to also be global. You need a global architecture that will enable this. At the moment, developing countries for sure are not enabled to undertake a Green New Deal. Even the monetary and fiscal policies that have been undertaken in the advanced economies have not been available to the vast majority of developing countries because of the way in which we, we have structured the global architecture and, and the vulnerability to capital flows and the dependence on monetary policies in the North, which determines what kinds of capital, what kinds of debt, and so on. And also developing countries are the places where the so-called contradictions that you had mentioned between development and sustainability are still perceived to be massive. So it's not just that we have to work to educate them. We have to actually make it feasible for developing countries to undertake these genuinely multicolored new strategies. Thanks, Shirti. Um, one, of, one of your roles is, is Executive Secretary of the International Development Economics Associates, which is an international network of heterodox economists. So, and and you you started your intervention with the with the suggestion that actually um, it's it's not just a different economy, a transformation in the economy. It is a transformation in economics. And and I just wondered if I could push you a little bit further on that, particularly in relation to the care economy, because it does seem to me that the care economy is a casualty of the economics that we have in a very, very fundamental way. And, and I just wondered what would be your vision for, you know, turning that inside out, starting, if you like, from a concept of care and building an economics out of that? How would that change it? So, you know, in a way, this also comes back to something Naoko said about how we value things. Unfortunately, the way we value things today, it undervalues nature, it undervalues care. And it's not just economics that undervalues it, it's society that therefore undervalued because every, everything is seen in terms of, you know, the, the remunerate, the monetary remuneration that you get. We have to bring in notions of value. And I think uh, Mariana Matsukato's work, you know, the value of everything is a very useful starting point for this. We have to bring back notions of value that contribute to society, to social progress, uh, public purpose uh, to more uh, just and equitable kinds of ways of social arrangements. So 
one of the things that economics has to do is to begin to figure out how to value care, assign and to therefore make societies value care. The undervaluation of care, it's, all, it's also the lack of recognition of the role. You would think the pandemic would make people change, but it hasn't. Care workers are still undervalued. Care workers, frontline care workers are still unprotected, unpaid, underpaid, and, and so on. So we need a fundamental uh, re-evaluation, if you like, of the notion of value, I would mm. say. Yeah, and I, mean, I, I can't, I probably shouldn't ask this question, but I can't help myself. Um, is there a sense in which uh, that undervaluing of care is gendered? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that is, I, I kind of took it for granted and therefore I didn't even mention it, but it's very, very strongly gendered. And of course, this has three aspects, right? The more unpaid work women do, the less all the work that women do becomes valued by society. So it's also that women then dominantly do the paid care work, which is therefore undervalued because they're doing so much of it free anyway. It is that any jobs that women do, those occupations become undervalued so that even men doing it face a wage penalty. And overall, society skims along with this massive automatic stabilizer it has created in the yep. form of this huge body of unpaid gendered care work. Good, thank you. I, I want to come back to that, that a little bit, um, perhaps in the discussion after, but let me let me first turn to, to Maya. Maya Gerpel is Director of Research at the New Institute, and I know that you haven't been there for very long, Maya, you're just finding your, finding your way there. Previously, she's been at the Wuppertal Institute and the World Future Council, and earlier this year, she published a book in um, Unsere Welt Neu Denken, uh, Rethinking Our World, um, which, which has been a bestseller in um, Germany, and I hope will very soon be a bestseller outside Germany as well. I'm sure you have some translations in the, in the, on the go, Maya. And I, I just wanted, I wanted you really to, to kind of give us your first thoughts on that fundamental question, rethinking our world, rethinking our ec economy, rethinking our economics. Where do you start? Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much, Tim, and thank you for everyone for already putting some of the issues on the table. I will try to speak from a point of view of a country that is oversatisfied, <laughs> and it does have its social problems, and it does have rising inequality, but it does not at all um, like talking about maybe having to allow for other countries to have more access to our planet. So we're very proud of our industry and we're very much right now, as was pointed out before, looking at the GDP curve and looking at getting to the V shape rather than the W shape of picking up the economy again. And there's no discussion really um, anywhere in the outset, what should be the content uh, behind that curve. And so I've, uh, we've, we found it difficult, and I was very, very encouraged that the book's become a bestseller because it allows for me to say, because uh, I've been working in the public discourse quite a lot right now, and this is what I'm trying to get, how do we shift public discourse, both we see here, that a lot of the excuses for not changing policy comes from but the people. It doesn't matter what the surveys say, because they're something like 80% have been saying before uh, the pandemic that they want to change capitalism so it becomes more sustainable. And that was a Bertelsmann Foundation survey, so it wasn't anything from a lefty, greeny or anything institution. And so how do we, how do we and kind of start talking about, because I've been given names like eco-dictatorship, seriously, like headlines in a full-page interview in one of the conservative newspapers, do you want an eco-dictatorship, Ms. Goethe? I mean, that kind of brazenness of tweaking what we're talking about. And the planned economy is the other thing. As soon as you start talking about issues like planetary boundaries, here they turn it into a planned economy. Even macroeconomists that I used to value a lot that have been UNCTAD leading economists. Now, don't refrain from saying this is a planned economy automatically. So how do we get to the point to communicate that just using science-based targets allowing for natural sciences to try to tell us what is a safe operating space does have implications that you can just number crunch down for fair shares for each country. So it's nothing ideological. It's not a lifestyle thing. It's not anybody wanting to tell you what your car should look like. But yesterday, only in a talk show, when I said there can't be as many cars in Germany in the future. So don't dream of everything being replaced with electric vehicles. And then now we're going to keep our ailing automobile industry alive by subsidizing them more so they can rebuild everything. As soon as that was said, the next day, it was 
planned economy again and the scientists want to tell the people what they can have and the markets would decide how many cars are here so the markets this other kind of entity has <laughs> never introduced itself to me but it's very strong in our discourse as the thing that was the just way of allocating who can have what and resources and so when i think about where it might be an entry point um, from COVID experiences, because sometimes experience obviously is easier than talking. And I felt that the relationship issue might be something. It was mentioned before, this trade-off between social and environmental. I think through us recognizing that we're really biological beings, we've been dreaming on going super intelligence out of mass and everything. We wouldn't need this body anymore, that stupid mortal thing. But now we've understood, A, we are biologically coded. B, it's very much linked with how we treat and what we're getting inputted into that body, how we are resistant to what is also coming our end, if it's a virus. So how do we use this massive trade-in experience? If you look for the health of people, you have to look for the environment. I found it so strong, the health workers petition in May already, 40 million represented by the signatures. It completely didn't make it the news. So how do, we, how do we start from that end, from where people are? And we're trying to work now with the planetary health diet, with the doctors, with the nurses, because it brings down the big picture to you individually through the health issue and the food issues. And so there is one of the relationship elements where I hope that we can talk about it more differently. The other one is, in general, it's very hard to talk about anything the state should be doing in recent times. But now we've been seeing that that discourse can't hold anymore. So state and market are not separate things anymore. Prices are political. But just to be able to say that and to show that, I still find it difficult not to be told off that this is exactly the planned economy. So how do we improve that communication? How do we make that more tangible and visible for people? Now, obviously, we can right now with all this kind of recovery funds, et cetera. And the last notion for me is really to think about resilience from a coherent and or holistic point of view, because I think the Joint Research Center had a good differentiation we now look at an OECD first study, look at the processes. How do we make the existing processes resilient? So they're immune to shocks without looking at whether they are actually sustainable in the first place. So not only look at the processes, but look at the input side. And there we go, obviously, to natural capital that needs to be regenerated, to social capital where trust and actually communication and connection between people was the thing that allowed for alternatives and creative solutions when the crisis hit. And then the human capital, what's the kind of knowledge that we need to become creative in those moments when crises are there? And the other side, the resilience in outcomes. So when we don't have access to this and that anymore, how can we still deliver on people's well-being? So we had a hackathon, a social innovation hackathon in Germany, where it was about how do we bring the groceries to the people that can't go shopping anymore? How can we make sure that they're not alone by themselves because they don't dare going outside? And so how do we get that creativity in ser serving the outcome on the service, on the needs servicing by being very creative and allowing for people have the capabilities and the connections? So this is where I'm trying to build it more into an innovation, creative, hey, we can do this better. But I find it really hard to be mm. hit so massively by this public discourse. And uh, this is why it's very helpful to be back in this, but I really need your help also. How do we phrase this differently so they can't make it so easily? Well, uh, let's, let's, let's pick up just one of, those, one of those points about phrasing things differently, because it's really interesting that you, uh, Maya, used the word, the, the phrase human capital, and Naoko used the word natural capital. And um, so, so in a sense, both the human world and the natural world have been yeah. capitalized, if you like. Um, is there a sense in which the language itself is tying us into old institutions? Is it correct to think about people's skills as capital? Is it correct to think about the natural world as capital? Do they behave as capital? Or, or is it actually just a language that we've inherited from an economics that no longer works? Um, Naika, you, you used the, the, the term natural capital, and I see all the reasons for using it, because it goes unvalued and undervalued if it isn't included. But is it already a concession to the old economic system to be using that term? <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, when I started the GEF, Global Environmental Facility job, eight years ago, uh, my background is actually the economics, and I was with the Ministry of Finance. And, uh, 
uh, quite some time. So when I try to say that uh, let's put the price on nature, <laughs> then I got a huge uh, backlash from conservation or kind of green community that uh, nature is so valuable and you can't really put the price on nature. But I, actually, I think that kind of movement uh, that the sense has been changing dramatically for the last maybe uh, eight years or so because people come to know that um, and, and we need to to find a way to actually that, that, that to, to value the nature and to find a way that another current let's say that not current economic system can can take into account that value and otherwise we continue to uh, push that the uh, that nature that ourselves into the actually out of the planetary boundaries. So I think that the both world are kind of coming together to create a kind of um, new contract. Um, I, I think that the Shalom um, uh, used the word social contract. And actually, I think that Jayati say that the, even the society undervalued the, the, the cares of a, of a natural capital. I think it's really time for us to come together to kind of think about what the new social contract may look like. From that point of view, I just want to put one uh, 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 idea or the sense to, to the audience and to this panel. I, I, I am now leading a new, newly created center for global commons. It's not just an environmental thing. It's really a how the humanity can take care of those globally shared common resources but then without having a kind of clear idea that how to steward it, how to safeguard it, steward it, this kind of global commons is continuously undervalued and continuously exploited. Our ancestors have some way to manage the local commons, our shared river basin, our shared community forest, our shared pasture. But uh, when the economy gets globalized, we somehow lost this idea that how the community, actually the humanity can take care of global commons. So uh, one way for me to, um, to, to put some answer to it, to provide a kind of instrument so that to, to solve this crisis is, is a possible for us to recognize the global commons as a kind of shared resources. And then can we come up with a social contract with trust and the shared value? So yeah, that's, um, that's, that's, really, that's really nice, Naka. I mean, it, because the way that you built that, you built a conversation using a different language. You, you moved away from the language of capital and talked about commons and, and social contract. And okay. should we be doing the same thing in terms of thinking about people, do we do we should be thinking about people as human capital, Jayati? Yep. Um, you know, the 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 women's work, the work of all those frontline workers, the the way that you've thought about work over uh, thirty five years of thinking about economics, you've done it in the in the face of an economics that characterizes that as human capital. Is that the wrong way to do it from the start? I couldn't agree with you more, Tim. I mean, I think you, I believe that, you know, we give away far too much when we use words like natural capital and human capital. And I'm so glad that Naoko, you know, sort of extended it to, to a wider and, and a more useful way. Look, what is capital after all? It's a social relationship. It's the fact that some control a means of production which they can own, and therefore they can control the labor of others and get surplus from it. We are ascribing that power, which is a social construct, to nature, to human activity, to human welfare. It's all wrong. You know, I mean, social capital is another term, frankly, that sucks. Okay, So I think we really need to move beyond those. These are the part of the economics that is holding us back. And I think Maya referred, in a way, to the, to the sort of power of the discourse, you know, in a, and of course, that reflects other political and economic power, all of which are holding back progress, genuine human progress in a way. So yes, one important way to begin is to actually dump these concepts, which are part of a baggage many of us often feel we have to use simply to get accepted in the mainstream. Do you, do you, think, that's, actually, do you yes. think that's happening, Jayati? Do you think that, that shift in languages, I mean, you're working inside economics and have yes. been for a long time. Is, is it happening? Well, it's certainly not happening uh, in, within the power structures, but it's happening quite a lot in the younger generation. I'm really uh, uh, very inspired by a lot of younger economists who are asking all the right questions, who are being quite uh, open and uh, fearless in the way in which they're addressing some of these long known kinds of difficulties. 
Unfortunately, let us admit it, economics is also about power relationships. And there is a lot uh, of time, energy, resources devoted to keeping the existing structures. And that uh, exists in the academy, that exists in the way policy, uh, you know, advisors are designed, are created and encouraged, that exists in the incentives that are available for economists in the profession. So it's strong. Yeah. It's a very strong thing that is perpetuating yeah. a certain kind of economics, which is, I would say, not just uh, no longer fit for purpose, it's counterproductive. But I do believe that there is a younger generation that is being much more open, much more uh, willing to address these issues. And I, I find a lot of resonance in these arguments among the young. So I think there's hope. Yes. Yeah. Whether it will I, come I, soon enough is another issue. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, point, I think yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's in a way that's the point about the younger generation is, you know, they have a, a, a high interest in having that transformation happen. Now, now, Maya, I know that you've you set up scientists for future um, alongside Fridays for the future, um, it, it, specifically to support that young younger generation. Mm -hmm. So you, you have some sort of insight into that. Do, do you think that, that this this shift in language, this transformational vision that, that we're looking for, it, it does have the purchase that Jayati suggests in a younger generation? Um, well, I think there's two elements to that. And one is that the first um, impetus was unite behind the science was more on the natural science, right? So it was about do accept there are these planetary boundaries. And it is really, really crazy to see again and again how the young have understood that this actually does mean budgets, limits, <laughs> something that you have as a more or less hard fact in your calculations if you accept the framework. And you can't just say you do and then not implement it in the way that you look at the solutions. And so this is where the scientists for future came and said, no, they do know what they're talking about because they were being told from the political discourse, go back to school, sit down, learn a bit of environmental engineering, come back in 10 years and help us solve the issue. And they said, no, 10 years late, <laughs> too late. We want to be citizens now and we want to be heard now. If we can vote yet or no, doesn't matter. We want to be heard that you change policy. And the, yet the other side then is about how to do it. And it's so strong still, um, the play off between especially work. So I think maybe if we really focus at what is work of the future, I've tried to do that more and more often now because they hold on to this one particular framing of it, which the 40 hour industrial worker as the ideal secured in Germany by unions. So they have their own vested interest in the growth of production staying strong in that sector so that their workers are not being laid off and they lose yet more members. So I would be really interested. It's a bit of a shame that we lost our union's voice because the just transition was a key crucial intercept in there. But we have to talk about what is the work of the future and not the future of work, because then we start already with one perspective on what work is ideally like. And that's been opening up quite a lot of the conversation, but and we've had a long and strong discussion about universal basic income and those kind of elements. So how do we really consciously balance always the social and the environmental so that we also go against, if you internalize the costs for nature, then the prices will go up and these poor people on their pensions and all that can't afford access anymore. So th those are a typical where it's still tried to be played off against each other. And so how do we get in the positive spiral of higher prices for products mean that the minimum wages would need to get up, mean that the inflationary um, targets and the whole calculation of what minimum income should be, et cetera, will go up. So, but there, I don't even see the math being done and it's not solicited by government to do that kind of modeling and to do those kind of things. And so, yes, on the one side, I think we need to talk differently in the public, but if we want to get into being recognized as talking within the discipline, because they're trying to oust you all the time, you're outside of the economists. Once you start talking differently, you're asked to be part of the activists. So how do we find... Well, is there a point, though, is line? there a kind of, is there a tipping point where there's enough activists, enough young people, enough <laughs> people interested in work, that actually the discourse has to change and they go back to their economics professors in their departments or their institutions or their politicians and they say, actually, this is not uh, the future that we want. Is that something that you see in 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 terms of a kind of cultural shift and your and your particularly your your work in trying to create the the language of that cultural shift Maya no it is growing I think there is um, a strong support from the young generation I absolutely agree to this and they are also 
I got the most touching emails maybe I get is from within the science profession that they say, I really look for people like you that challenge the frameworks in which we had to perform. And I think INET, uh, the Institute of New Economic Thinking, has done these kind of studies as well, the gatekeeping functions of what can you publish when you want to get into the excellence clusters. So there's a whole element there about what is the science framework of excellence allowing to percolate up as the best ideas in a society and no. Yeah. And so, yes, we do have that as well. But the question is still, how do we really tie this well together that becomes a positive feedback loop quick enough? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So it's, it's really unfortunate. We, as, we, as you say, Maya, we lost Sharon um, because she had to go to another engagement. We have to stop in about three minutes time um, because there is a heads of state transformational leadership seminar following this. This is obviously a conversation that we could go on and on. So mm -hmm. um, next time we're going to put in a plea for a longer, a longer session on transformational economics and we might get something done. Um, I'm going to give you just as a bit of fun towards the last end of the, of the, of the last comment really from each of you. Um, Saturday week ago, um, it became clear that across the other side of the Atlantic, there, there will probably be, if things go well, and according to law, there will be a different president in place. Is that something which has changed your views of where, of what is possible and of where the economy is? Um, and, and is it something that could be a transformational moment? And I'm, I know that's a huge question, very unfair to ask at this point, especially because I'm going to ask you to answer in about 30 seconds flat. So I'm going to start with uh, Naoko. It's been a pleasure having you here. These are your, these are your final thoughts, Naoko. And, um... Well, uh, maybe my answer will disappoint you, but uh, it's not really because uh, I see the huge transformation really comes from more like a non-state actors because I have continuously seen the kind of failure of failure of kind of sovereign based <laughs> international engagement. To me, I have much more faith in the younger generation that the consumer, the investors and uh, like Monday, the innovative CS, uh, CEO and CSO and the city. So it's a great addition to have a one big company, a country has a right to leadership. But then, uh, to me, I have much more faith of this uh, multi-stakeholder and more like an ecosystem trust based than the leadership going forward. And you think that happens to whoever the leader, sh whoever the leader. Of course it helps. Okay. Of course it okay. helps. Good, yeah. good. Um, Maya. No, I'm very happy that we seem to be coming back to something that you call a decent way of engaging <laughs> if, if you have different views. And I think that helps tremendously. And the reinstallment of both scientists to look at COVID and scientists look at climate. I mean, for us, it's gigantic. We, I think my fear was huge when it was all about, oh, fake science. Everybody can make up whatever they like as a kind of evidence base for a country's policy decision making. And I think it's going to be interesting now within the Democratic Party, how they're going to resolve their kind of wingy elements. Yeah. So there's lots of very, very progressive views there and, and certainly a, a sense of reaching across the aisle that may not be easy, particularly, as you pointed out before, as soon as you try and reach across that aisle, you're told you're planning something rather than letting exactly. the market do its work. <laughs> but, um, OK, um, Jayati. Yeah, I, I agree with Maya. You know, I really feel that it's not just the US, it's the whole world that has dodged a very major bullet or maybe even a cannonball. Because uh, what we've stopped, what we've stopped is, I, I think, really a sort of headlong rush into destruction. Let's admit it that you know we were basically um, destroying all the possibilities of dealing with what is going to be one of the greatest existential challenges to humanity that we will have to face. That doesn't mean it's all the problem for sure. It's finger in the dike stuff. But thank God there is that finger in the dike, and now we can get on with the work. I think we also don't realize, I know coming from a country where we have had authoritarian leaders get second terms, we don't realize how bad second terms can be in terms yeah. of how much worse they would be in terms of destroying their institutions and things. Thank you. So, so yeah, I think the world has dodged a bullet. Let's make use of it. I, I kind of agree with you. I have a sense of relief that is absolutely enormous and, and, and in no small part, and I want to just finish on this gender point in a way, it makes it slightly easier to be a man um, than it has done over an era in which um, masculinity has been trashed, not just by, <laughs> not just by economics, but by politics as well. Um, but it has been a huge pleasure to preside over an, an all-female panel of economists talking about the transformation of economics. And I'm going to hand you over now to your next session on transformational leadership.